Amen. I want to play for you a sound that might, might possibly be the scariest sound you have ever heard. Probably the most terrifying sound in all the world. And no, I'm not talking about it when, when, when Tickle Me Elmo starts to lose its battery power and makes that freaky noise. No, I'm talking about something more serious than that. In fact, I want to just share this sound with you, see if you can identify this. Now, it's a, it, it may be a little loud. Just give you a heads up. That is the sound of my wife waking up in the morning. <laughs> Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I will not tell her that you said that in service today. She's serving next door here. Anybody know what that sound was? Somebody said a car? Somebody said a lion? Somebody said lion? a lion? A lot of people are saying lion. You're not there yet. Anybody else? Not a grizzly. That's good. good answer, though. Good answer. Julie Roberts said tiger. It is a tiger. In fact, it is a Bengal tiger, not the Cincinnati kind. They just grunt. It is the kind that comes from Indonesia. Bengal tigers are one of the most feared creatures on the planet. They really are. In fact, they are responsible for more human deaths than any other cat, and that includes lions. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Tigers have, they're just starting to find this out, researchers are finding this out, that they have a secret weapon they didn't know about. Uh, they knew about the claws, I mean, the massive claws that could tear apart animals, people. They have these teeth that are just incredibly strong. In fact, that's usually how they kill their victim. They go after the neck of their victim with their teeth. But they have another weapon. It's actually in their roar, but it's more of their growl than it is their roar. What you just heard was, was really their secret weapon. Their growl is louder. Their growl actually attracts other tigers in the area to circle their prey, but the roar that is more of a growling roar is a low, low sounding, low wave frequency type of growl. In fact, some of it you weren't able to hear because it went lower than our ears can hear. You know, like infrared goes, that light wave goes below what you can see because it's such a, such, a, such a low frequency. You have these infrasounds that actually occur below what we're able to hear with our ears. And yet, those who have actually been in a jungle and come face to face with a tiger and heard this kind of growl, actually, who lived to tell about it, not all of them lived, but those that actually lived to tell about it said it was like something actually went through their bodies because even though the sound waves are too low to hear when the growl goes that deep, they're able to feel it. And it actually tingles the spine and paralyzes the victim for a moment. Just enough of a hesitation for the tiger to make its attack. Whew. You know up here you ought to run when you hear it, but you're not able to. Now, why did I share that with you? Well, because Halloween is tomorrow night, and you know there's a lot of scary stuff. I want to do a little replacement therapy with you. There's a lot of scary stuff going on in the world. And after Halloween, you've got the election, and you've got all these clown appearances, don't you? And other people who aren't even running for president. You've got these, you've got these, these scary things, right? And all I want to do is give you something to be more afraid of. Because if you could actually be more afraid of the growl of a tiger, and you don't live near a jungle, I hope you don't, you'll never have to worry about it. That's good, pretty good replacement therapy, right? Okay, let's, let's talk about Halloween, because it seems like it's weird this year. Does it feel different to you? It does to me. It feels like I don't even want to do this thing. It's scary. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world that I just don't... They're talking about the Cold War starting over again. Are we going backwards? Things are just not right, and it's so uncertain, and there's a lot of fear. The other day, actually, it was probably a couple weeks ago, when volleyball season was still going... I went to pick up Riley late one evening from an away game. It was our turn to bring the drinks for the team, and so I'm standing outside the bus waiting until the girls get off the bus so I can go on and pick up the cooler. And when they start coming off the bus, they're acting really strange. I mean, 
stranger than normal, right, Katie? They're acting really strange. They've got this fear in their eyes. One by one, they would run off the bus and run up onto the loading dock. Run off the bus and run up onto the loading dock. Run off the... And they're all huddled in a group over there. Finally, one girl, she stops in the doorway, doesn't even get off the bus, looks at me and says, is there anything under the bus? No, it's all good. She runs off the bus and up onto the loading dock. When we're driving home, I'm asking, Riley, what in the world is going on? She said, well, somebody, one of the girls saw a clown following the bus. And, they, and, and, and then they couldn't find the clown anymore, so they think the clown jumped onto the back of the bus and was now, by this point, underneath the bus, ready to attack them. I'm like, man, over, -imagi over uh, you know, the imagination gone wild, right? But then I turn to Riley, and, she, and, and I see that this is truly affecting her as tears are streaming down her cheeks, and I'm, oh, I'm sorry, honey. You know, tell me about it, and I'm, I know this is a crazy world. She says, Dad, I don't even want to go trick-or-treating this year because somebody might dress up like a clown. This is the kind of world that we're in right now. It's kind of weird. It's kind of wild, isn't it? So it's different. It feels different, doesn't it? There was this survey done of the, of the fears that uh, we have in 2016. You know, they, they, I, guess, I guess government money went to this probably. Chapman University study, America's top fears of 2016. And I know you're thinking that clowns ought to be the first one on the list, but it's not. Re this is more of a recent fear. This is, this is the overall top fears of all of 2016. And yet I say clowns didn't make the top of the list, but maybe they did, kind of. <laughs> Corrupt government officials. You can tell we're in a political season right now. Terrorism, of course, makes the top of the list. So does not having enough money for retirement. That is always a fear. That makes the top of the list all the time. So does this one, people you love dying. Other fears that made the list, identity theft, small enclosed spaces. Man, that one freaks me out. Anybody here get freaked out by small? Yeah. Um, how about needles? Ooh, yeah, needles. How about technology? You want to scare some, you want to scare some old person on Halloween? Just take your phone and go, boo. You'll have to pick them up. All right, so then you got volcanic eruptions. What? But it's on there. How about germs? There are people that, I'm, I'm picking them from the bottom of the list now, okay. How about clowns? Of course, clowns has to make it, and that will, as, the year, as we keep going, that will probably rise on the list. Now, there's one, there's one more, there's one more, and this one just blew me away. I could not believe this even made the list, but it, there were enough people that have this fear that it's there. It's the fear of zombies. Do they, do they, they're not real, right? They're not real. So these, these are our fears uh, in, in, in America, and it amazes me that the roar of a tiger doesn't make the, because if we could just get afraid of tigers, we just wouldn't have any other fears to worry about because it's just terrifying when you think about tigers. Replacement therapy is real. It actually works. So we are uh, in this year of move. And the idea is we don't want to just believe some things. I, I think as Christians, we're guilty of this all the time. I have these things I believe. In fact, we'll, we'll post about how strongly we believe them, what our convictions are, and we will, we will make our case against others who have other differing beliefs. But what Jesus really wants us to do is to have conviction enough to live out these beliefs, to live them. And so as a church, we're trying really hard to move. And the idea is there are certain things in our life that where we're at is not where we want to be. We want to move beyond that. We want to get to a better place. For fear, we want to move beyond fear, right? We want to get to a place of peace. We, we, we need to move. And so as a church, we, we have all this momentum going, and it's really cool to see the momentum that's going. In fact, we're, we're, we're going to begin the process. We've already got nominations that are closing today for elder and deacon. That's exciting. Raised up servant leadership in the church. That is really exciting to see all the names. It's exciting. We have a, we have a slab out here. We've, we've got the, the foundation ready for, they, they're ready for the block out there. It is absolutely amazing. And if you have not yet had a chance to go out, go out and see it. It'll just blow you away how far they've come. The weather's been favorable. They're moving, moving faster than the schedule. So that's really, really cool. We have all this stuff going on. All this stuff. In, we have a new youth minister that's arriving this week. Isn't that cool? 
and you guys are going to love him. You're going to love him. Uh, he's got, he's got this, this, this really unique, cool personality, and I think, uh, I think you're going to fall in love with him. Uh, if, if, if you don't, we'll take him. You know? So if you don't want him, you know, we got him because we love him. So it's, it's really cool. A lot of momentum going, but we want to make sure that in our, in our personal lives and as a church, we get past the areas that we seem to get stuck in, and we move to the place that God wants us. We want momentum to be not just what we're doing corporately as a church, but what we're doing in our spiritual walk as well. And fear is something we've got to get past. So we're looking at the life of Jesus this year in the book of Mark, and we've looked at a lot of different aspects. We're not going to look at the momentum of moving from where we're at to where we want to go. And so we go to Jesus to ask the question, what does Jesus say about fear? Now before I even try to answer that question, just think for a moment, what do you think Jesus says about fear? What have you been taught Jesus says about fear. I imagine if we went around the room and we asked several, there's going to be some that are, that are going to say things like, shouldn't fear. I mean, if, if you have faith, you shouldn't fear. I mean, I mean, God is bigger than everything, so we should not have fear. In fact, one of the followers of Jesus, John, one of his closest followers, the beloved disciple, he loved Jesus, Jesus loved him. John wrote three books Later in the, the, the gospel, or later in the Bible, we read them as 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and in that, he shares with us how we should respond to fear. So if we were to ask one of the closest friends of Jesus, what would Jesus say about fear? He would probably respond with this. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. And you know what? That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you are completely enveloped in love, where is there room for fear? If you are loved completely, it doesn't seem possible that you could actually be afraid at the same time. And yet, and yet, and yet, we have experiences all the time where we are completely in love with Jesus, and yet we still fear. Because it's an idea that makes sense, but our heart still beats fast when we find ourselves in scary situations like when your daughter brings home that boy, and you know which one I'm talking about. Fear, heart goes. We have that fear. Let me, let me give you another situation and see if this is true for you. If you were driving out in, on, on a back road somewhere through some cornfields, not very many houses around, it's very dark at night, the moon's not out, it's very dark at night, and, and your car breaks down, there's a certain amount of fear that comes up, isn't there? You're all alone, the car breaks down, and you go to reach for your phone and find out it's dead. Oh, the fear rises. The heart starts to beat a little bit. You don't just say, oh, I'm so in love with Jesus. This is, this is cool with me. In fact, I'm so glad this happened to me because I get to test how much I love Jesus. And then you look in your rearview mirror and there's a guy walking towards you like this. And he's wearing a clown mask. I mean, you see clown zombie, you are afraid. Even if you don't believe in zombies, you're afraid. Fear, be afraid. I get that. And your heart goes like crazy because clown zombies are something you should fear. Be afraid. So what do we do with this? You realize that in the Bible there are 365 passages that say do not fear and yet in the Bible it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge and we got to somehow get our heads around that. We've got to wrap our minds around that. There is something that John means when he says there is no fear in love. But what does that mean? Now the only way we can get to that answer is go back to what Jesus taught John about fear. There was a moment where John was absolutely terrified. Do you remember that moment? Absolutely terrified. It is a passage that we have looked at in the recent past, so it's going to be a little bit familiar to you, but we need to go there again. Here it is. That day when evening came, what day? It's the day Jesus taught. Jesus was teaching, and we did a series on it called Grow. What he taught about was things like sowing and, and reaping, that uh, there are certain grounds that uh, seed actually doesn't do well in, and that represents our heart, when our heart is shallow, when our heart is hard, when our heart is, is loaded up with all the other cares of the world. This, the Word of God doesn't actually do anything in those hearts, but in a good heart, it grows. And he says that you got to trust that God is growing in you and transforming your life. In fact, the way that he shared that story is, you know, a farmer goes out and sows seeds, and then it, he, he waters it, but he goes to sleep. He doesn't even he doesn't even know how it happens, but in the morning it starts to sprout, and the next day it starts to grow, and it just keeps growing. He doesn't know how it happens. God does the growing. God does the transforming. These are the teachings that Jesus was teaching this day, that day when evening came. He said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was. I love that statement, just as he was. 
unshaved, unshowered, uh, hungry, and tired from teaching all day. We have a lot of teachers in here. You know how tiring it is to teach. It's exhausting, just as he was in the boat. They, there were other boats also with him. A furious squall came up. I don't know what a squall is necessarily. I'm sure it's more than a gust or a gale, less than a tornado hurricane. But it's, it's furious, so it's bad stuff, whatever this squall is. And waves are breaking over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. It's about to drown. And I don't know why drowning didn't make the list of the 2016 fears, but as a boy, that was one of my biggest fears. Jesus was in the stern. He was in the back, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, it's amazing, he's sleeping, and, and here's the boats rocking like crazy, and waves are coming over. He must be wet by now, and he's not waking up. Why? Because he was teaching all day. He's exhausted. It shows his, his humanity, and they, they shake him, and they yell at him, I imagine. And they say, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care? Those words must have really hurt Jesus. It must have really stung, hit him deep, because... Man, he's given up having to come down and he's taught them and he's shown them mercy and he's given them miracles and he loves them like crazy and he'd do anything. Don't you care? But they're afraid. And when you're afraid, you're not always rational. Don't you care? Jesus doesn't have time to rebuke them for that statement, but he does go after the storm. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And this is where we get that idea that, man, if, 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 if you have faith, if you believe in Jesus, there can't be fear. You should have no fear. And yet, if that's what Jesus was trying to get across, they failed miserably because look what happens next. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They were to the point of near death. They were about to drown. The waves were beating against the boat, rocking the boat, oh, flooding the boat. The water was being taken on. They weren't going to make it if something hadn't intervened. And yet, they, even in that fear of death itself, Jesus stands up and controls the storm. Someone greater than something that can kill me is standing in my boat telling the storms to be quiet, to calm down. And it terrified them. It rocked them. It was as if the winds were howling, but Jesus got up and roared louder, and it caught through them to the core of who they were paralyzing them. And they were shaken. And they were shaken. I want to go back one verse. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Oftentimes we read that as you should not have fear. But that's not what he said. He said, why are you so afraid? So afraid implies that there's levels of fear. Jesus understands their, humi their humanity and he says, I get it, your heart's racing. You see the storm, you see the water, it's coming on, it's rising up in the boat. You don't see an answer, but at some point you should have turned around and seen me and taken comfort in the fact that I'm on board. Haven't you seen what I've done for you? Don't you know what I'll do for you? Don't you believe that I can take care of this? I get it that you're afraid. It's a human reaction. It's part of being alive. The heart races, but at some point, you've got to take that fear and put it on me. So afraid. So afraid means you are going to experience fear. Just don't stay in that how do we do that? How do we not stay in that fear? Going back to that verse, he says, you still have no faith? It's by your faith that you get through this. It's by your faith that you overcome, but not the faith we think of. Oftentimes when we see the word faith, what we're thinking is, oh, I better get stronger. I better get bolder. I better have more confidence. I need to boost myself up. I need to stand against the storm. I need to be like Jesus and tell it to quiet down. That's not what he means. It's not this. Oh, this fear is not real. No. It's not, I can overcome this. It's not even faith that Jesus is going to take care of all of our problems. Sometimes we think that and we, we, just, we just 
say a mantra over and over again, Jesus has got this, Jesus has got this, Jesus has got this, he's gonna take care of it. Sometimes Jesus is gonna take care of you, but you have to go through the storm. Jesus, he's, he's got this, he'll solve all my problems. Actually, what Jesus wants is faith in himself, faith in Jesus, abiding in him, being in the one whose roar is louder than the roar of the sea and the waves and the wind. He wants you to be in Him, in His strength, relying on His power. One time I was with my best friend, Tim Newman. We were traveling in my red truck, and, and, and I told you already that I'm not really a great driver, so it's another <laughs> bad driving experience. I, w I wasn't a great driver as a teenager anyway, although there are some people that would say I'm still not a very good driver like the guy that I hit in the McDonald's parking lot in Indianapolis. He might say that I'm not a very good driver, but I was really a bad driver as a teenager. So I'm driving and I'm fooling with the radio and we're talking and we're going to the back of the mall because all the cars hung out there, just kind of hang out after the mall was closed. And, and, and I swerved because I was looking down and almost hit another truck with a couple of teenagers in them and I guess they were bored and looking for a fight. And, and I didn't even know they followed us. I thought, woo, I scared me, scared them, we're done with this. They followed us till we parked, and they parked on Tim's side of the truck. It's a blazer, so I didn't see them over there. I wasn't really paying attention again, and I was a teenager. And um, so I get out of the truck, and all of a sudden I realize there's a problem, because Tim is talking in a real loud voice so that I would hear him say, hey, we don't want any trouble. It was just an accident. Everything's cool. Guys, calm down. I'm thinking, oh boy, we're in trouble. So I had options. I had options. One option was to jump back in my truck, drive off, leave Tim behind. <laughs> that seemed like a really, really good option to me because, you know, I don't like confrontation. But I'm with Tim. I, it's, it's really weird. You, you've got friends like this that, that just exude confidence, right? Maybe you're that person. Maybe you've got a friend that, that is that person. Somebody in your group, they got confidence. Well, they, they, if Tim found himself being jumped by a, a group of guys, he, would, he wouldn't run away. He would fight all of them, no matter how many there are, and he'd go down swinging. And I just knew, I'm with Tim. We got this. Now, this is crazy. I, I've never done this before, but I, I decided, we're going to fight today. I'm a teenager, okay? I, I, I'm, I'm not thinking straight. You guys are not gonna, you guys are gonna give me a hard time tonight. I know it. I'm picking on you way too much. So I decided to do something that is totally out of character. This is a split second decision, totally out of character. I stood up real straight, puffed out the chest, and I walked around the corner. I said, Is there a problem here? In my deepest, lowest voice. Tim picked up on that cue and he said, There's no problem here. These fellas were just leaving. And it worked. They said, mumbled something like, well, just don't do it next time. Got in their truck and drove off. Now, I share that with you because we have someone greater than Tim. Tim and I, we, we'd do anything for each other. At least we say that. But here's the reality. We have someone who has done everything for us. His name is Jesus Christ. He took our sin debt upon himself, went to the cross to pay it in full so we don't have to do it because our sin debt is worthy of death. He died in our place. He will do anything for us. This is the same man who stand, stood up in the middle of the boat and roared louder than the waves because he is more powerful than anything this world can throw at him. And he, says, he is saying to us, if you are in me, if you have faith in me, I will take care of you. I'm not going to guarantee that the storms of life aren't going to beat against you. I'm going to guarantee that the tower that you are in is stronger than the battering ram that comes against it. I am your fortress. I am your strong tower. Trust in me. I have the strength to bring you through. It may not be easy. It may not be fun, but it's going to be victorious in the end. Have faith in me. Have faith in me. Could it be as we think about the roar of Jesus, louder than and stronger than the roar of the sea, that somehow having faith in Jesus is more like entering his fear, coming into the very presence of the power of God. I know, I know, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? And, and yet, this is, is, is what actually replacement therapy is all about. Thinking about the, the idea of taking what it is that you're struggling with and placing it upon Jesus who's stronger than you or stronger than the circumstance or the event or the trial you're going through. 
It's saying, I will not stand here and continue to let my heart beat after I hear the doctor's test, after I get the test result, the grade from the teacher, or the breakup from the boyfriend, or the whatever. I am not going to stay here. I'm going to give it to Jesus. I'm going to recognize that fear is human, but staying there is, is just not faithful. Enter his fear. Here's what Oswald Chambers says about it. The remarkable, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Isn't that true? I know it seems so strange to talk about, well, fearing God though, how, how does that help me to overcome the fears of this world? And some of us get it though if we've had a good father growing up. Now, I realize not all of us have had this, but some of us have had it, and if you haven't, just look to that friend that has, and you'll know what it's like for a father who's authoritative, who is strong in the family, who leads the family, and you're in his arms as a little child being protected by the same strength that the enemies ought to fear because he's going to do everything to protect you. You can sleep at night because you don't worry about what's going on outside, especially when the storms rage because daddy's roar is louder. That's a healthy fear. That's a fear that, that starts to answer the proverb that says the beginning of all knowledge is the fear of the Lord. In Deuteronomy it says, oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commandments. You see how the obedience and fear go together? Abiding in Jesus is abiding in his word. It's trusting him. If we trust him, there's something that he's going to do for us. Because this is not done. He says, oh, I wish they'd fear me and would keep my commandments because I want to do something great for them. That's a daddy who wants to provide for his son or daughter. That's what our God is like. So that is so important in this sentence because it's saying if you do this, if you abide in me, if you rest in me, if you trust in me, if you come close to me, it will go well with you. And... Their children will go well with them and their children will go well with you. It will, he will provide for you. Think about the time that Moses was out tending his flocks in Midian and realizes that there's something unusual going up higher in the mountain than where he was at. There was this bush in the distance that was on fire and it was bright and it was blazing. It amazed him too, so much that he made the trek up and over the mountain to get closer and closer. And as he got closer, he realized that that bush was still green. It wasn't wilted, it wasn't being burned up, it wasn't being consumed. The, the bush was a blaze of fire. And he kept getting closer and closer in wonder. He was drawn to it until a voice from the bush called out to him and said, Stop. He called him by name, Moses. You can't approach anymore as you are. Now what he didn't say was, Get away from me, I'm a holy God and I will consume you. He says, Take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. What he's saying is, I want you to approach me, but I want you to do it reverently. And he takes off his sandals, and he begins to approach closer and closer. Now, we're not told how close he got. In my mind's eye, I see him getting so close that his clothes should be on fire, and his hair and skin should be singed, but he's not. He doesn't even feel hot, but it's a blaze, because he is in the glory of God. He is in the holy place. Not because he is holy, but because God is holy and he has come into the presence of the Holy One, sanctified. And he stands there in the blaze that should burn up everything outside. In fact, that's what our hope is, that the roar of the fire would be greater than the roars of life and everything that is out there would be consumed, that are our enemies, that we would stand in the very heat, in the very passion, in the very heart of God. And that we would understand that this is also the place of love like a daddy who draws his child in. Psalms, the psalmist says his, pre, his pleasure is not in the strength of the horse nor, in, nor his delight in the legs of a man. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. The psalmist ties together fearing him and love and maybe that's what John started to recognize. God, Jesus loves me so much that though he can calm the storm with the roar of his voice and it intimidates me, it makes me shudder when I hear it. He loves me. And all that power is not against me, but for me. 
And when I stand in his presence, I'm protected. Oh, my heart will race when I get the news, when I get the report, when it happens that, that, that I didn't want to happen. But he is for me. Fear is a gift. It's a gift given to every human being. We have fear that keeps us out of danger, fear that keeps us away from things that hurt, fear that protects us, fear that keeps us healthy, fear that keeps our marriages together, fear that keeps our children uh, healthy and strong. It's a gift. But it's a two-sided gift because that fear that, that begins to race the heart is not the place you stay, the place you stay is in the fear of the Lord who's greater than whatever you're going through. Knowing that he can conquer it. That's the fear and that's the gift that he will fight for you. So how do we, how do we move past when the heart is racing, when the news comes, when the trial hits, when the suffering is intense, when we're shaking, how do we be okay with our humanity that this is real, this, this is human, and at the same time, go beyond it and give it over to God? Replacement therapy is actually something that counselors practice with those who are struggling with carrying the burden and the weight of the world. I learned this when I was a teenager. I went to a youth group that I just thought I was really going. My, older, my younger sister invited me. I thought I was going to meet girls, and, and you know, that was my whole goal of going to youth group. I, I had no other purpose and uh, just absolutely started to be changed because I was listening to what the counselors said and what the youth minister said and this community of, of believers who absolutely loved the Lord. And as much as I pick on you guys, you guys are awesome. And, and, and you guys are, 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 you remind me so much of the youth group that I had that really pulled me out of the world and gave me a safe place. And as I was sitting there one night, the youth minister had us all close our eyes. And he said to us, there's something right now that you're carrying, that you've been carrying a long time. And that I was carrying a lot. You know, as a teenager, this is real life, this is real world stuff. I know some people say, well, you wait till you graduate, then you're in the real world. Come on, are you kidding me? Have you been to high school lately? This is real world stuff. Carrying the burdens of the world, these are real burdens. These are relational problems. These, these, these are temptation problems. These, these are, are purity problems. These are real world stuff. I'm carrying all of it. And he said, you're carrying it for way too long. Did you realize that Jesus wants to carry it for you? I had never thought of that before. Jesus wants my junk? And I just closed my eyes as he told me to, and I visualized just giving it to Jesus, and my shoulders were, for the first time in years, lifted. The burden was gone. Now, I picked up burdens again, but I had to remember to lay them down, give them to Jesus, because he wants to carry them. I imagine you're going through something today. Maybe there's a big fear that you're facing. That maybe you've been letting the heart race way too long. It's okay to fear. You've just stayed in it too long. You've got to get back to Jesus. Maybe it's not a fear. Maybe it's a trial. Maybe it's a struggle. Maybe it's a temptation. Maybe it's a mistake. Maybe it's a bitterness. Whatever it is that you've got, I'm going to ask that you close your eyes and bow your heads. I want you to see Jesus. We're given this beautiful gift of imagination and we can see him in our mind's eye. And he's full of warmth and he's full of love. He's stronger and bigger than any problem you face. And he's willing to carry your burden. Will you give him your burden right now? Just take the bag off of your shoulders and hand it to him. He will carry it for you. Feel the release. You're free. Stay in the roar 
of our God. And nothing outside that roar can scare you again. And every time you find yourself outside the roar, come back to this place. Give it to him again. Because he loves you. Father God, thank you for helping us. In our greatest weakness, and our greatest burden. Thank you for taking it upon yourself. Your desire is not just to carry our sin to the cross. Your desire is to carry all of our hurt, all of our struggle, all of our wrongs. To take them off of us and to free us. To give us that peace we long for. And God, we know that this is only a momentary thing because the world will continue to pile on. Remind us of this moment. Because right here and right now, it feels so good. This is the faith you want us to have. Father, for those that are struggling with things that they, they can't see past, that they're so big, they've given it to you, but they're still shaking. You've also given us friends. You've given us accountability partners. You've given us people around us that love you. We're not supposed to do this thing alone. For those that are struggling with something huge, not only do we have to lay it in your lap we have to share it with those who love you give us courage to do so Father help us to make a commitment to do so right now thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus name